Oh, they're not out here. <laughs> kind of a witness. He's coming. I apologize. Okay, now I think we're ready to get started. The Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs will get rolling here. Um, start with an opening statement, uh, and then the, obviously the ranking member will have an opening statement, and then we'll get right to our witness. We want to thank the deputy for, uh, for being here today. Um, earlier this month, we learned that the unemployment rate rose to 9.2 percent. Americans are struggling because there just aren't enough jobs. As I have said many times before in this subcommittee, one reason explaining the stagnant jobs numbers is the administration's stubborn determination to issue multiple onerous regulations all at once. The cumulative impacts of these regulations are preventing American job creators from putting people back to work. As part of the Committee's ongoing commitment to promote job creation, today's hearing continues our examination into Federal regulations that are holding back economic growth and keeping employers from getting Americans back employed, back to work. At the last hearing, this subcommittee focused on EPA's permatorium on Appalachian coal and the impact it is having on jobs in that region. Today's hearing will examine the cumulative effect of a series of EPA regulations that will impact the Nation's power supply and will hit particularly hard the areas of the country that rely on coal for energy. I am especially concerned about my home state of Ohio, which is the Nation's fourth largest consumer of coal and depends on it to provide power for its manufacturing base. These regulations have been collectively referred to as EPA's train wreck. They include changing the standards of cooling water intake structures, altering the mercury and air toxic standards for power plants, known as Utility MAC, and the cross-state air pollution rule, also known as the transport rule. New regulations of coal ash and finally lowering the national ambient air quality standard for ozone, among other rules. And we have a chart that shows how all this is coming together in the next few years, and we will seek to get uh, at the impact this is going to have on um, employers. The job-killing threat posed by these regulations comes from the timing and expense of the various mandates. By EPA's own analysis, these are some of the most expensive rules on record. For example, EPA estimates that the utility MAC rule is projected to cost $10.9 billion in 2016, and the cooling water intake rule could cost as much as $4.8 billion a year. NOx for ozone is projected to cost a staggering $1 trillion in cost to manufacturers and, according to the National Association of Manufacturers, lead to 7.3 million jobs lost between 2020 and 2030. The Committee is deeply concerned that as the EPA developed these regulations, it never took into account the cumulative impact of its actions. The North American Electric Reliability Corporation, an organization charged with ensuring the reliability of America's bulk power system, warns that the EPA's regulations will remove as much as 76 gigawatts of electrical capacity by 2018. To put this in perspective, this is enough electricity to power approximately 23 million homes forever. Moreover, according to another study, just the Utility MAC and Clean Air Transport rules alone will eliminate 1.44 million uh, jobs from 2013 to 2020 due to the rising cost of energy. In fact, this same study estimates that Nationwide electricity costs will increase by 11.5 percent. Our State of Ohio and other Midwestern States will be hit even harder. EPA should, e should have considered the cumulative impact of these rules before acting in order to minimize these negative impacts. Let's make one thing clear. No one wants dirty air, and that is not what this hearing is about. However, we do need to be smart about the regulations that we as a country issue. It appears from the lack of analysis on cumulative regulatory effects conducted by the EPA that there is a high chance the left hand doesn't know what the right one is doing at the Environmental Protection Agency. The testimony we hear today will help us examine what can be done better to avoid these regulatory train wreck situations. Our economy has been in trouble for a long time now, and the least we can do here in Washington is make sure the government is not causing the problem. 
Americans want to get back to work, and we need to be certain that we are not, that we're not stopping them. I thank the witnesses for appearing, and I look forward to hearing from all our witnesses today. And with that, I would now recognize uh, my good friend and distinguished member from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, all the witnesses who will be testifying today about a critical issue facing America, the protection of clean air and clean water on which we depend every single day. Today we will once again take a look at the role the EPA plays in supporting these goals. Air toxics from coal-fired power plants cause or contribute to devastating health problems ranging from asthma attacks to premature death from cardiovascular disease, stroke, and cancer. One air toxic, mercury, damages the developing brains of fetuses, infants, and small children, robbing them of the, the opportunity to fully develop intellectually and physically. Coal burning emissions of sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides help fuel our nation's asthma problem and can increase heart attacks. The burning of coal is also a major contributor to the uh, environmental national security and economic crisis uh, that, is, uh, that is global climate change. The combustion of coal produces a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas that contributes to increased trapping of heat in our atmosphere. In fact, coal accounts for roughly 20 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions. It would be difficult to underestimate the urgency of shutting down coal power plants immediately for this reason alone. These health and environmental consequences from toxic pollution are why the EPA is developing tougher safeguards to protect Americans. One proposed rule on mercury and air toxics alone would be estimated to save as many as 17,000 lives every year by 2015 to prevent up to 120,000 cases of childhood asthma. One of the witnesses here to testify today represents the American Electric Power uh, Company, which is headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. AEP is also one of our nation's biggest polluters another one of Ohio's polluters, First Energy Corporation, which owns the Lakeshore plant in Cleveland uh, near my own district, is identified as the nation's sixth most harmful plant for low-income communities and communities of color. Thanks in part to AEP and First Energy, the State of Ohio has more coal-fired generating capacity than any other state in the nation. Ohio's electric sector is also uh, the uh, uh, dubious honor of ranking first in the amount of toxic air pollution it emitted in 2009 emitting more than 44.5 million tons of harmful chemicals, which accounted for 65 percent of the State's pollution and 12 percent of toxic pollution from all U.S. power plants. Ohio also ranked third among all States in mercury air pollution from power plants with about 3,980 pounds emitted in 2009, which accounted for 76 percent of the State's mercury air pollution and 6 percent of the U.S. electric sector pollution. AEP has also lobbied against the Environmental Protection Agency's current efforts to regulate power plant pollution and is pushing legislation to weaken and delay these regulations. I look forward to hearing from AEP today about how they can justify the tragic and destructive side effects that coal-fired power plants wreak upon us, as well as what steps are taking to curb emissions of toxic air pollution. While well, it is consistent with the history of big business to kick and scream about having to minimize social and environmental harms they cause, we should not underestimate the entrepreneurial ability of America's electric se sector to invest, retrofit, and construct clean energy generation while maintaining system reliability. In fact, when they upgrade our nation's electric generation infrastructure and comply with new regulations, their capital investments will help drive economic growth and create jobs. According to a study by the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts, two of the proposed EPA regulations, Clean Air Transport Rule, and the new mercury and air toxic standards could stimulate the creation of 1.4 million jobs over the next five years in the pollution controls, engineering, and construction fields. Congress passed the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act because the American public demanded it. The American people demanded it because they didn't like their children to inhale and drink and die from toxic compounds from which even the most diligent parent can't protect his or her child. Nothing about this equation has changed. We must allow the EPA to continue to fulfill its mandate to protect our water and the air, and I look forward to hearing from the EPA today about how it continues to fulfill this promise. We can't get into a position where it is either jobs or a clean environment. We have to insist that we have to have both. 
and, and, and the approach in the 21st century that is going to be economically viable and economically successful and that will help grow our economy is to be able to catch the wave of new technologies that can help use the resource we have now and do it in such a way that we protect the quality of the air and the water. Uh, with that, I want to thank the Chair, and I yield back. I well, thank the gentleman. Members have seven days to submit opening statements. We now welcome our first witness, Mr. Bob Perciusepi. It's a great name to say. It's like saying Sheboygan or saying it's one of those names you like to say. That's wonderful. Like uh, Kucinich. Yeah. yeah, like Kucinich, exactly. Is the Deputy Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. We feel privileged to have you here today, uh, Mr. Perciusepi. And pursuant to rules of the committee, all witnesses are sworn in. So please rise and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give. This committee will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Answer in the affirmative. Let the record show that the witness has answered in the affirmative, and the floor is yours, Mr. Administrator. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Ranking Member uh, Kucinich. Would the gentleman please speak directly into the mic? It would be helpful. Yes, sir. I thank you. will get a little closer there. I see, I see what you are talking about. Um, I want to thank you uh, for inviting me today, and I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you. Uh, when you ask uh, whether EPA regulations will cause the lights go out, I want to be able to assure you that the answer is no. We do not have to choose between breathing clean air and running an air conditioner or turning on the lights at night. The power plant rules that EPA is developing are necessary to protect public health and the environment from pollution produced by these plants, especially the oldest, dirtiest, and least efficient of them. We are not the first administration to recognize the need to clean up power plants and to, and to issue rules to address that need. In fact, since 1989, when President George H. W. Bush proposed what became the Clean Air Act, amendments of 1990, power plant cleanup has been the continuous policy of the United States government under two Democratic and two Republican Presidents. While past EPA rules have made progress in reducing the harmful effects of pollution, more remains to be done to ensure that all Americans have the clean environment to which they are entitled. EPA's recent and upcoming actions to control pollution from power plants will achieve major public health benefits for Americans that are significantly greater than the costs. These pollution-reducing rules are affordable and they are technologically achievable. There is tremendous public support for moving forward with these rules. For instance, in March, we, since March, we have received over 800,000 comments from across the country in support of regulatory mercury emission controls from power plants. The cross-state air pollution rule finalized earlier this month, month illustrates significant health benefits from reducing power plant pollution. In a single year, 2014, this rule is projected to produce benefits valued at over $120 billion to up to $280 billion and to avoid up to 34,000 premature deaths. Our analysis and past experience indicate that warnings from some of dire economic consequences of moving forward with these important rules are exaggerated at best. A publicly available analysis shows that these rules are affordable. This is corroborated by other outside groups and by some in industry who recognize that issuing the rules in the same time frame helps provide power companies with the certainty they need to make smart and cost-effective investments. As we did more than two decades ago, we are also hearing claims that our rules will lead to potential adverse effects on electric reliability. EPA's analysis projects, projects that the agency's rules will result in only a modest level of retirements and that these retirements are not expected to have adverse impact on electric generation and resource adequacy. Our rules will not cause the lights to go out. These studies are often based on incorrect assumptions about the requirements of EPA rules that, and are inconsistent with the actual proposals that come out. In most cases, the analysis were performed before many of the regulations were even proposed. Simply put, many of these studies are not based on the reality of what the agency is actually proposing to do. In closing, I would like to suggest that the subcommittee should be clear about what is at stake here, as those who have stalled in cleaning up their pollution for further delays. Delay encourages companies to keep cash on the sidelines instead of spending it and putting people to work, modernizing their facilities. And most importantly, delay means public health benefits of reducing harmful pollution are not realized. Thank you for allowing this opening comment. I look forward to your questions.
Thank you, Mr. Deputy. Let me just uh, start with one of the things that the ranking member referenced in his opening statement, and, and I think you alluded to it as well, was the jobs that can be created when you have to refit and retool and, and, and make changes. Um, but did, what do you say, to, or, and, and did you look at this, this idea that there can also be job loss? And I, as I pointed out in my opening statement, the National Association of Manufacturers, they cite the, the number 7.3 million jobs they believe that can be lost between 2020 and 2030. So did EPA look at all at the other side? Obviously, we know if you have to retool something, there is going to be someone come in and put those, you know, go to work, putting that structure in a, together in a different way, retrofitting, do, doing what needs to be done. Obviously, that is pretty easy to calculate. But did you look at the other, uh, the other side of the ledger? Yes, when we when we look at the cost of rules, we, we look at all the different aspects of it under the under the OMB regulations that we're required to use. And I might say that um, American industry and in, and in particular the American power industry is becoming more and more efficient. Even over the last ten years, even without these rules, the amount of megawatts that are produced continues to go up. Well, every business has been and doing that. Every business is doing this. Oil refineries, power plants. The amount of output continues to go up, but the number of employees continues to go down as, the, as they become more and more efficient over time with more efficient plants. And some of the transition that takes place when we enact these rules is creating a more efficient uh, fleet of, of power generating units. Did, but, but I guess I want to be clear. Did you do what the executive order requires you to do, which is a cumulative impact study on, I mean, I am reading right here from the executive order, each agency shall tailor its regulations to impose the least burden on society, including businesses and individuals, including businesses of differing sizes. Did you, did you comply with the executive order? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we propose a rule, like, let's say, the uh, mercury and air toxics rule, we start from the base that includes the rules that have already been done. And then we want to be able to make sure we specify what the current rule that we are proposing is actually going to do for transparency purposes, so we can look at how that builds on the cumulative impact of what has, been, what has gone before. Can you look at the statement then on, on, on the screen? It should be in front of you there on, 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 on your screen. Which um, RIA are we talking about? Um, coal ash, the coal ash rule. Oh, I see it on the bottom. I am sorry. Yeah. Well, that, that proposal um, is out, uh, has been out, and we have put out some additional um, uh, requests for information on that. Um, that is a, a quite a ways away from being finalized. Okay. Let me, let me ask you this. Do you think, though, that um, a, a more general question, do you think that there is ever a point where regulation can, in fact, be a strong impediment to job growth and actually um, be, actually cost jobs, actually in the, result in the reduction of jobs. Do you think that that is something that should be kept clear in, 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 uh, in mind as we are proposing new regulations? Well, I think we have to look at the economic impact of rules under the executive orders you have pointed out, and, and, and that is what we do. And we also try to do it based on the foundation of what has already gone by. But EPA also goes beyond that, you know, particularly under the Clean Air Act. We look at the um, cumulative benefits and costs of the rule, uh, of all the rules altogether since the Clean Air Act was the amendments, at least, of 1990, so let's say going back 20, 20 years, uh, under Section uh, 812, I think it is, of the Clean Air Act, we do a cumulative uh, benefit and cost analysis on, on the entire implementation of the Clean Air Act. And mm -hmm. um, the costs and benefits so far from since 1990 uh, are um, about uh, ahead by about 30 to 1. Okay. Can you take a look at this statement? Because of these complexities, as well as the limited time and resources within the expedited schedule, we are limited in our ability to quantify the cost and benefits of attaining separate secondary NOx for ozone for this proposal. So that would seem to indicate to me that you did not do a full cumulative impact study, because you, you say right in your statement, cost and benefits, that is what we are looking at. That is the cumulative uh, issue there. You seem to say you are not, not complying with it uh, in that statement there. This is the, yes. So um, the National Ambient Air Quality Standard is a, is a standard. It is not, it do, it's not self-implementing. What, what it does is it sets in motion a 
a planning process that goes on for a number of years to identify where those areas are in the country that would not be meeting that standard, and then what are the, the implementation mechanisms that are used to implement or to achieve that standard. Each one of those requires that kind of detailed analysis once we get to that point. But the standard itself is a science-based standard based on what and does you know, and, and does the EPA have any idea what that that standard is going to cost when implemented? We, that's we, the point. We do we do a regulatory impact analysis that looks at 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 the at the best estimate we could make because all the implementation comes years later. We do look at the best. Imp, uh, and what was your best estimate for this for for the NOx? Our estimates um, of benefits and cost um, when depending on on all the different. Standards that were proposed by the. Can you give us uh, a number? I mean, on one hand, you're saying you're going to create jobs for retrofitting the facilities, but we want to know overall if you did an estimate. Yes. What was the estimate on what it was going to do to job creation or job loss? Well, I, we did the, the overall cost of the rule, and the overall cost of the rule. Um, I, I'll have to I'll have to look it up for you. What the. Um, and obviously, cost means. We did the cost and the benefits. In our proposal, but additional cost to business means it's going to be tougher to create jobs. Would you agree with that statement? Wouldn't you? Well, the cost, those that particularly if it's a big number, which you can't give me. Well, it depends on what the final standard is, which we haven't yet decided on. We haven't yet promulgated the final. Can I just standard. ask well, one last question? I want to yield to our ranking member. Um, wouldn't you agree, though, that all this coming at once? I mean, you think about over the next several years, we have cooling water intake structures, utility MAC, the transport rule, coal combustion residuals, the ozone, I mean, all these different things, some starting now, but some more coming online soon. Don't you think that is a real cause for concern and that it is critical that you be able to provide an estimate and do the full cumulative? I mean, you can obviously see the concern that folks in this industry, in this business, which is so crucial, uh, uh, crucial to manufacturing and a host of other, you can obviously see their concern. Yeah, I, the, these these rules were proposed. M many of these rules you just mentioned were actually proposed in, in the past, uh, and the, they were they were th they were uh, sent back to EPA by the by the courts. The the air transport rule that you mentioned, the uh, the air toxics utility air toxics rule, those were proposed in the past in the, in in the last decade, and now they've been coming back and having to be. Reproposed things like the ozone standard you mentioned get implemented over a long period of time into the future, and some of them, like the um, like the um, water intake uh, three the the water intake uh, rules under the Clean Water Act or the coal combustion uh, rules uh, under the Resource Conservation but the, the, Act those haven't been Mr. Deputy, finalized. But the point the point is, it's all coming. And it's coming pretty quickly. And if they, even if they maybe have been proposed and they're graduate, they're they're phasing in and phasing in at, at at different levels or higher levels. That's a concern. Well, um, I will just respectfully say I probably don't agree with that chart that okay. you just had up there. Okay. I'll yield to the gentleman from uh, from Ohio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think it is fair to say that the utility industry is hysterical that the, uh, with claims that the new EPA regulations are job killing. Uh, in contrast, as the slide I would like to put up on the screen shows, a report from the University of Massachusetts entitled New Jobs, Cleaner Air says the home states of each member of the subcommittee on Eastern Power Grid would fare very well with respect to jobs created by the new investment in capital improvements. Our own State of Ohio will gain as many as 76,240 jobs to build the capacity to implement the new regulations in their first five years. So I would like to ask uh, Mr. Perciuseppe, how does the EPA's own risk assessment analysis square up with these findings from the University of Massachusetts? Well, I have to. <clears throat> I have to say, I haven't looked at this particular report. In, in okay, detail, then you don't so have to I comment don't. on it. Will, will, the re, will your regulations destroy more jobs or create more jobs? Um, our analysis shows, particularly on these utility rules, that it will create jobs. Okay, we are going to hear from industry representatives in the next panel that claim that compliance with the new mercury and air toxic standards and the transport rule is not achievable, not cost effective. 
These industry advocates are making claims of dire economic consequences if we move forward with these rules. Some of our witnesses today will say that environmental protections will cost too much money, kill too many jobs, and their competitiveness. But this is familiar. Industry always claims the sky will fall if they have to minimize the health and environmental harms their business practices cause. We heard the same thing from the auto industry when airbags were required. We heard the same hysteria when the Clean Air Act rules were passed in 1990. Ford Motor Company said in 1990, we just don't have the technology to comply with, quote, unquote, the tailpipe requirements set forth in the amendments. And yet they started making cars that complied with the tailpipe requirements in 1993. Now, Mr. Purchaseppi, can you talk about how industry fared after the 1990 amendments? Are there any lessons to be drawn here with the new proposed rules? From your perspective, is industry exaggerating the detrimental impacts of the regulations? Well, um, some of the studies that we have been able to review um, have a number of that they have done to demonstrate these, uh, these impacts have some significant flaws to them. First of all, and I mentioned this in my opening comments, they, they make assumptions about rules that we haven't finalized yet. For instance, on the cooling water uh, regulation that we have been talking about, they, they, some of those studies have assumed that every power plant that uh, will, would have to in install a closed loop cooling system or a cooling tower. That is not what we proposed, and we still haven't even finalized that rule. So, uh, these end up uh, causing uh, exaggerated estimates of what the cost of the rule would be. They don't differentiate between plants that are getting old and need to close or need, for economic and business reasons uh, need to be phased out as new uh, generating capacity comes out versus ones that might be associated uh, with a, a, a rule that EPA is, is proposing. Um, they, also, let me, let me, they also don't include the flexibilities that are in the Clean Air Act, that when you, get, when, when, when you actually implement these, these rules, there are certain flexibilities that are included in the Clean Air Act that are not uh, considered in these studies. So they, by, by definition, then, they come up with an exaggerated uh, estimate of what the impact would be. On July the 20th, 2011, The Washington Times ran an op-ed by Steve Milloy, the publisher of JunkScience.com, titled, Show us the bodies, EPA. The subtitle reads, Green Agency uses phone death statistics to justify job-killing rules, quote, unquote. The op-ed described a TV ad run by the Environmental Defense Fund saying, the TV ad for this theme features a young girl in a hospital bed supposedly having an asthma attack. She is wearing a nebulizer, face mask, and chest compression device that is rhythmically but disturbingly squeezing the child, given the appearance that she is in severe respiratory distress by implication from air pollution. But like the EPA's 17,000 lives saved statistical fabrication, the ads are fake. Now, um, uh, Mr. Purchaseppi, I would like to give you a chance to respond to this op-ed. It is apparently aimed at EPA's proposed toxic, uh, air toxics rule. Are EPA's estimated benefits from the proposed rule a statistical fabrication? They are based on, based on peer-reviewed science. They are not a statistical fabrication. And uh, you are not going to see on somebody's death certificate they died of air pollution. They are going to die of the diseases that air pollution um, exacerbates and causes premature impacts. Um, even healthy people are impacted, but people who are more vulnerable, um, like retired folks, are, are going to be even more vulnerable to these things. So the, 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 the impact of, of the damage on the lungs and the cardiovascular system. So I, I know you have other witnesses that will go into, this, uh, into the science that is in more detail, but these are not fabricated. They are based on peer-reviewed science, both clinical and uh, epidemiological studies. Mr. Mr. Malloy's op-ed also questioned the public health impacts of mercury pollution. He wrote, but there is no evidence the ambient levels of mercury or mercury emissions from U.S. power plants have harmed anyone, quote, unquote. Now, Mr. Purchaseppi, isn't there clear evidence showing that mercury impairs the brain development of infants and children? There are, there are um, mercury warnings in every state for a fish contaminated with mercury. Um, mercury causes damage to developing brains in children and fetuses. So is that but, a yes? But, uh, so yes. Okay. okay. Can you describe why it is important to control mercury pollution from domestic power plants? Isn't there a disproportionate impact on communities near plants that, that emit mercury uh, pollution? The, um, the mercury emissions from the power plants in the United States are the largest remaining source in the, in the United States of mercury emissions, and they are uh, they affect the uh, the water and the um, 
and the, and the, bio, and the mercury bioaccumulates uh, in uh, fish, in, and then fish get eaten by, by humans. But I want, to be, I want to point out one last thing on this point. The, the mercury and toxics uh, rule is not just mercury. It includes acid gases, arsenic, uh, nickel, cadmium, um, all these other uh, metals and, and acid gases that also have health effects are included, which is why uh, you have to look at the broad impact of all those different toxics, not just mercury, although mercury is very important. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You will back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Deputy, do, do, you think, do you think your rules could result in a higher cost uh, for energy? When we analyze the cost of our, of our rules, and let's just use the, um, the, the, the air toxics, uh, the, uh, the utility act, as you call it here, or the uh, mercury and air toxics rule, we do estimate that it will have an increase in electric rates and, and, a, and an increase in natural gas rates. So you, these increases you, are expected to be the United in States, the variability of historic levels of but, these. But these let me just ask, I just want to be clear. So the United States Environmental Protection Agency admits that the rule changes will result in higher uh, electricity cost. A very small increase in electric costs. But actually, the electric cost, let me, even but, with Let me be clear. Rules, you say there is going to be an increase in cost for energy. The, the, the increase in costs will still, the, the cost of electricity will be less. Is the answer rule, yes or no to increase well, energy? I, if I could just answer, it will be, to answer your first question, it will be, the, the cost of electricity will still be less than it was in 2009, even with the increase. And, well, it then follows out. Um, if there is going to be increased energy costs, do you think that can also translate into lost jobs, or maybe not as many jobs being created as otherwise would have been. I say it is it's, and, and, and we are and we're talking, to, you know, obviously we are talking to people who use the energy. Oh, I understand that. And, and I want to I be really clear. The, the baseline that people currently pay for electricity is less than it was several years ago, and this increase will keep it, it still will be less than it was several years ago. We do not see it having I, 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 maybe, an impact. Maybe you are missing the point. What they are paying now, are your rules going to make it Later. I'm not worried about 2009. I'm worried about now. We have 9.2 percent unemployment now. So what they're paying now are the rules you're proposing going to mean energy cost more. And I thought the answer was yes. Is that what you're saying? It will be. It will. And be. so furthermore, if the answer is yes, which it is, then there could be some other results, ramifications down the road for job creators and businesses across the country at a time when we have 9.2 percent unemployment. We, we do not see the, the small increase in, in the price of electricity from this rule, which is not different than the normal variation in the prices over the last decade, to have any significant impact. You may not, that. but my guess is small business owners, my guess is manufacturers probably do. When they are faced with a tough decision, can I keep these families, these individuals employed who rely on their families relying on this, and I got to make decisions, look at my bottom line, look at my fixed costs, look at everything else, they probably do see it as important. You may see it as not important and negligible, but they probably do. Let me ask you another question here. If, if Mr. Kucinich had the, um, the jobs created to retrofit and, and, and retool, and you, you pointed to that as too, but, but I guess I want to ask, this is the old basic economics principle, opportunity cost. If you are not spending those dollars to retrofit and retool your facility, you probably use them some other way, maybe to create jobs, maybe to do other things. So would you, would you agree that while, sure, they are going to have to, there may be some jobs that are created to retool and refit, that is money that they could have used somewhere else but for the fact that you are making them retool and refit? Well, first, it creates jobs and permanent jobs, and second, it creates all those health benefits I just mentioned. It is hard to get that double benefit. But you would also agree, with the, it's also the, agree with the opportunity cost. When money is spent cost, one place, it can't be spent somewhere else. The cost benefit ratio of this kind of expenditure is, is more than 5 to 1, 10 to 1. Um, the, um, well, uh, the small businesses, who, who could, in theory, be impacted from small prices increase, this is such a small increase that it could be well within their, their ability to make energy efficiency Again, uh, controls. Again, it is uh, always easy for government to say that. It is much tougher for the individual or the family well, or would, the business actually owner to actually money. have to implement it. They would actually save money and be able to invest it in their business. 
So wait a minute. Now you're saying it's, it's increased they, energy costs is actually going to be a savings? How does that work? If well, if they implement certain, you know, very simple energy efficiency uh, um, um, measures in their own business that most business people are looking at. Well, I'm sure now. they're doing that if it makes sense yes. on their own. They don't need Correct. the government to tell them to do that. No, that we're not. That's right. We're not. Okay. I'm just saying okay. that this is what normally would happen in in a normal business. I didn't world. expect to take five minutes. I will be happy to yield back to the ranking member, or we can go. To, I'm, I'm good on time. I would go to you, or I can go to the, the vice chair of the committee. Okay. Thank, I thank the gentleman. We will now yield to the vice chair of the committee, who is actually going to take over for the chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I apologize for missing the first round of questions. Um, thank you for being here today and your willingness to testify. In your analysis for Utility Mac, you estimated that it could lead to pollution control um, related capital investment of 45 to 50 billion dollars and that this could create 35,000 jobs per year by 2015 Do you, uh, I, I I think our estimate is it's about is about 10 billion I'm sorry in our final rule and um, um, our estimate is 10 billion and our estimate is about 31,000 um, temporary jobs and about 9,000 uh, permanent jobs. Well, I, think I, I, I think I'm right on that. I want to make sure total annual cost is $10.9 billion. The annual benefits are about 59 to $140 billion, so it's a 5 to 1 cost-benefit ratio or 13 to 1 cost-benefit ratio. And I think I had the job. Uh, analysis, right? I'm sorry. I wanted to make sure I gave the numbers that we have there. Okay, so you're saying this could have been in the uh, proposal, um, uh, but I'm I, I'm happy to dig into this here uh, for you uh, if I can. Well, if you'd like to elaborate or, or explain, because that's the information we had, and yeah. and you can see the cost per job. No, I see that, is, and, uh, and I would like to um, be able to provide some information for you on that. Okay, well. It, can you provide that information today, or would you like to provide it? Well, I, I, I have to, I have to go look at the technical support document and see where. It, but I, what I just gave you are the numbers in the final proposal: ten point nine million. I'm sorry, billion a year, um, thirty-one thousand temporary jobs, nine thousand permanent jobs, uh, benefits of, of fifty to a hundred billion. Um, Including uh, 17, 000, six, seven to seventeen thousand premature deaths avoided, eleven thousand non-fatal heart attacks avoided, uh, and um, I'm not going to read them all. But um, this is what was in the final final rule. The cost benefit of this is about five to one, or at the high end of the range, thirteen to one. So, what is your estimate that the cost is per job? The cost, the annual cost of the rule is ten point nine billion. With, nine, with ultimately uh, around 9,000 permanent jobs. And so what does that cost per job? Well, it, the, the purpose of the rule is to achieve 17,000, avoid uh, premature deaths for 17,000 adults, 11,000 nonfatal heart attacks, 5,300 hospital emissions, 6,900 emergency room visits, 4,500 cases of chronic bronchitis, bronchitis 11,000 cases of acute bronchitis. I, 8, I those are the things that we add up as a benefit side. I understand side. all that. But if you are using this as a justification because it creates jobs, we, we have to look at the cost per job and say, does that even make sense? Well, we are looking at the benefits of all these health benefits. Um, I, I want to get on to a, just a different topic here. Um, recently, the EPA announced that it is going to reconsider the ozone, um, again, the NAS standards yes. established in 2007. Can you explain or tell me why that um, the uh, EPA decided to review and, and actually an expedited, uh, on an expedited schedule, they are not really ready? The 2012 would be the appropriate time. Well, the, the ozone standard was um, last proposed in 2008, and um, uh, it was um, uh, there was litigation about it, and and um, the standard that was proposed was outside the range of the um, Clean Air Act scientific advisory uh, council or committee that was set up by the Clean Air Act. 
Um, uh, we saw that as um, legally vulnerable, and, uh, and so it was remanded back to EPA by the Court back in, in, in that time frame. We have been working on it ever since. We haven't we have proposed it, but we haven't yet finalized it. And it is in agency review right now, um, but we haven't finalized the, uh, the reconsideration of the ozone standard. Are you under a court order to, uh, to uh, well, we've, this expedited the, the, review? The, the, there is a stay on the litigation um, that eventually probably will be lifted by the judge, but right now we are acting under a stay on the litigation and, and, and with, um, with the, with the um, understanding that we would propose it by the end of July. And we have told um, um, the litigants uh, as, as early as uh, this week that uh, we are not going to be able to make that July 29th uh, deadline um, and that we are still in the interagency review process. So we are going to do it as soon as possible, but it is still going to take some time. My concern with that is that the uh, environmentalists, rather than EPA and the appropriate branches of government, are, are establishing our environmental policy. Well, we were sued by um, all different litigants, as you my, my time has expired, and I, I yield five minutes to the ranking member, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Purchasepi, the House is currently debating H.R. 2584, an Appropriations Act that included a rider that blocks the EPA from implementing its rule to control air toxic emissions, as well as the cross-state air pollution rule controlling interstate transportation of nitrogen oxides and particular matter emissions from power plants. Uh, sir, if this legislation became law, what impact would it have on EPA's ability to fulfill its mandate under the Clean Air Act and implement the air pollution rules covering pollution from power plants? Well, if you uh, make the assumption that those uh, riders would uh, not allow us to spend funds in the, in the budget on, on the, finishing the, the work under those rules, it will delay further. It has already been delayed almost a decade, the health benefits um, and the certainty that industry has said that they want. Can you quantify uh, what those health benefits uh, were? Um, well, I just listed the ones for the um, uh, which I think is already in the, in the record in the answer uh, to the Vice Chair. So um, uh, I will, uh, will get here in a minute from my able assistant the actual numbers for the um, I might probably have some of them. Well, your, well, your able assistant is uh, gathering those numbers. Uh, from the cross-state uh, um, Right. I would just like to go over those numbers. Here, thank, here we go. Thank, thank you. Um, Number, please. It is um, 13 to 34,000 premature mortalities, uh, 15,000 nonfatal heart attacks, 19,000 hospital emergency department visits, 19,000 acute bronchitis events, uh, 420,000 upper and lower respiratory symptoms, 400,000 aggra aggravated asthma, and 1.8 million days when people will miss work or school. Those are the benefits that will be delayed, along, along with the ones and, that— And is that, is, is that delayed on an annual basis, or is that delayed on a 10-year basis, or what? Annual. Annual. Yes. Uh, has, has EPA ever done a uh, quantification of that in terms of the dollar uh, cost to the economy of that? I and mean, people are sick. You know, it is expensive. Well, the, the monetized benefits from those annualized uh, health benefits I just listed, and that was for the— um, cross-state um, cross uh, rule are $120 to $280 um, billion a, a year. And, um, so what is the, what's the monetized cost to uh, public health? That, well, Somebody's paying, so you are saying that, that's, that, that is the, the cost, those are the, the benefit, if you, if, you, if you have the rule and the rule goes into place, people's health, are, and, uh, people's and health is protected. And uh, on the other side, if you don't have the rule, that rep represents a loss or a cost that is being absorbed by people in terms of an attack on their health. So in a way, uh, and, and that is what you are saying, right? Yes. Okay. So, so, so let us look at it this way. I mean, this is the way I look at it anyway. These rules don't go into place. 128 billion is it annually? That's the low end. The, the low end, 128 billion dollars annually, 
it's the cost in terms of human health. So, or as you said, if it's a, if it's corrected, it's a benefit, but it's a cost now because they are, the rules aren't in place. So these companies are making profits, and and here's the point: if if you have environmental conditions that are aggravating human health, and EPA is trying to mitigate those conditions with a rule, and those conditions are are not um, resolved, and the industry keeps building their profit margins, while having not to make any investments at all in cleaning up the environment so there wouldn't be these untoward health effects, what you actually have is a, is a direct transfer of wealth in terms of the, the cost of human health from the mass of people to the utilities. This, is, this I think, is one of the underlying problems that I have with the fact that utilities refuse to abide by rules that protect human health, because people pay for it. People actually subsidize the profits of the utilities with, their, with the public's health. So that $128 million or billion ends up a payment that people make with their health, and, it's, and in a sense, it's a transfer of wealth to the utilities. That's just not fair. It just isn't. And, and it's, it's manifestly unjust. I find it it morally offensive, and while I am with my colleagues and being concerned about jobs, uh, look, you know, how many people and their families have to uh, sp uh, spend so much of their time taking care of the illness of a loved one who, uh, who may have their illness exacerbated because of air pollution? Please. Thank you, Ms. Um, Ranking Member. Mr. Kucinich. Um, I have a couple more questions. If, um, and I just want to say something about what the ranking member just brought up. And I think, I mean, I've spent my whole life in the health. I'm a nurse. I was a health care attorney. So I'm very concerned about health, public health. And I don't think anyone on either side of the aisle is saying we don't need regulations. But what we need is reasonable regulations, regulations that encourage people to be entrepreneurial, encourage people to take a risk, not thinking that they will be beat down, and when they do comply with regulations that, you know, around the next corner those regulations are changed, so then they have to retrofit and they have to recomply. Cost of compliance, as I talk to small businesses throughout the district, it's, it's, it's absorbent, and it really is a, a deterrent for people to take the risk and to go into business. So I think all we are talking about here and we are asking the EPA is to be reasonable, to understand that every one of those new regulations, every one of those regulations that get put into a book have an effect. They filter down to some poor small business owner whose bottom line is and his profit margin is very slim. And, and one more change or one more law to comply with or more, one more regulation may be what puts him over. And I think that is more and, and if we look at it that way, we are talking about public health, but we are also balancing it with a 9.2 unemployment rate in this country. We have got to look at this thing in its entirety. Uh, you look like you wanted to comment. Uh, uh, you know, those are very um, reasonable words, and um, I think we share the desire to make sure these rules are implemented in an appropriate way. Uh, we are trying to provide time in the rules, uh, flexibility with uh, trading. Uh, allowance trading. Um, uh, EPA has other flexibilities if, if things get uh, tight on a reliability front. Um, the other side of the coin is, is also trying to make sure that there is a, uh, a clear path. These rules have been lingering for a decade, and, and, and we are in this parallel universe of people saying we need certainty so we can make investiga uh, in, in, investments. Uh, but if we, if we create the certainty, then there is too much that we think we might have to do. And the truth of the matter is it's, you, you need to know where you need to go. You need to have that path of where to go, but at the same time we need to have the flexibilities that are available in the, in the Clean Air Act. And, and I, think, I think this country can do it, and uh, it has been able to do it. Uh, GDP has gone up 205 percent since the Clean Air Act was enacted. 
uh, while pollution has gone down almost 60, uh, over 60 percent. This, this last, these last increments are going to uh, are, are really going to pay dividends in, in, in public health, and uh, we need to make sure we do use the flexibilities that are in the Clean Air Act. Thank you. I, I only have two minutes left, so I have one more question here. Um, the Assistant Secretary of Energy, James Wood, uh, stated that, number one, electric rates are going to go up. And um, I would like you to comment on that. I mean, do you agree with him that electric rates are going to go up? And I will enter uh, Mr. Wood's uh, article into the record, if there is without uh, any objection. Yeah. Well, um, I, our regulatory impact analysis that we have done on these, let's just say these two rules, um, indicate that electric rates will go up from a base that is lower than it was in the last decade. So the variability in the electric rates are going to be uh, small compared to the variability the electric rates have had before these rules are out there. That said, when we do, um, when we did um, work on these, on, 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 on some of these rules, we definitely used the, the small business panels to help us look at the impact on small business, how the rule could, uh, how small business could accommodate the rule. So we have looked at, at those things as well. But, but there, there is, um, there, there is a, a slight increase in the electric rates that, uh, on average across the country, and we have identified that in our regulatory impact. We are not hiding that fact. We are trying to put it in context. I don't mean to interrupt, but my time is clicking away here. Um, but I will say your estimate came in the lowest of anyone's estimate as to what their electrical rates will do. And again, that goes back to jobs and job creation and small businesses. I mean, it may be a few pennies, but may, it may be not be a few pennies. It may be more than that. And that may be this one single factor that pushes uh, either deters someone from going into business, the cost of doing business, or worse yet, it uh, forces them out of business because they've, uh, they can't meet their uh, bottom line. So with that, my time has expired. We are going to do another round of questions. I yield my five minutes to the ranking member. Uh, Mr. Pritchett. Mr. Purchaseppi, uh, American Electric Power claims that the cost of complying with the regulations affecting power plants will result in an increase in electricity prices of 10 to 35 percent. According to EPA's own regulatory impact analysis for the final transport rule, the agency's economic model suggests an average national price increase for energy is 0.16 percent, just a fraction of 1 percent. Under the toxic rule, the agency's economic model suggests the average national price increase for energy is 0.8 percent. This is a long way off from 10 to 35 percent. Can you explain the discrepancy between AEP's figures and your own? I haven't studied how they uh, came up with those well, estimates, but um, I would say that um, EPA has been historically able to um, uh, estimate uh, impacts of our rules, and we are even conservative in our impacts on, on how we estimate well, our impacts on rules. So it, it could have been any number of things that they have included in their assumptions that, uh, that we, we would have to look at. Well, why don't you obtain the information and get back to this uh, subcommittee so that we can make an evaluation of their claim? Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will uh, call our second panel to the witness table. And thank you very much for being here today and for thank offering you. your testimony or information to us. Thank you both, and, and thank the chairman.
Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. Our second panel consists of Ms. Janet Henry, who is the Deputy General Counsel for American Electric Power, uh, Dr. Joel Schwartz, um, Professor of Environmental Epidemiology, Harvard School of Public Health, and Mr. Mike Carey, President of the Ohio Coal Association. Good afternoon and welcome to all of you. Uh, pursuant to the rules of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, if I could ask you to stand and please raise, raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative. Thank you very much. I would ask that each of our witnesses, if you could, limit your opening statements to five minutes. Uh, I know that the ranking member has an amendment to offer on the floor, and I would like to give him the opportunity to uh, lead off the first round of questions before he has to leave. So, Ms. Henry, if you would proceed, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify regarding the impacts of the EPA's suite of new regulatory requirements for the public utility sector. AEP is one of the Nation's largest generators, with nearly 38,000 megawatts of generating capacity and serves more than 5 million retail customers in 11 States. We employ diverse kinds of generating um, of energy sources, including coal, nuclear, hydroelectric, natural gas, oil, and wind power. But coal is important in our States, and approximately two-thirds of our generating capacity utilizes coal to generate electricity. We believe that the current regulatory track being pursued by the EPA will have damaging impacts on our Nation's electricity system, as well as broader negative employment and economic implications. Together, they will require very large capital utility investments on a very short time frame. AEP has already achieved substantial SO2 and NOx reductions over the past two decades, beginning with the acid rain program in the 1990s and continuing with the NOx SIP call and the Clean Air Interstate Rule. AEP's SO2 emissions have been reduced by over 1.1 million tons. That is about a 73 percent reduction in emissions. And our NOx emissions have been reduced by 80 percent over that same time period. In just the past 10 years, AEP has invested over $5 billion in emissions control equipment on our coal units to reduce SO2 and NOx. About two-thirds of our fleet is currently equipped with the most efficient SO2 controls, and about three-quarters of the fleet in the Eastern System has the most advanced NOx controls. Two projects were completed in the last 18 months at our Amos Power Plant, and we are preparing to submit applications for regulatory approvals to install additional controls in Indiana. We expect this transformation to continue and our emissions to continue to decline. We are committed to working with EPA in the development of future control requirements, but we have concerns about EPA's proposals. They include the infeasibility of the compliance deadlines. The cross-state air pollution rule will take effect in less than six months, and the reductions in several states required by 2012 represent more than a 30 percent reduction in emissions over 2010 emission levels. Multiple regulatory programs are going to be taking effect in a very compressed time frame, resulting in unprecedented capital expenditures mostly before 2015. There would be two to three times as much capital spent in the U.S. to comply with these new EPA rules by 2020 as has been spent over the past 20 years. Abrupt and significant power plant retirements are likely to occur due to high costs and infeasible compliance deadlines. We expect that between 50 and 110 gigawatts of coal-fired generating capacity will retire due to the proposed EPA rules. And with those retirements come increased risks of unanticipated electric grid reliability problems, particularly during the 2014 to 2016 period. The greatest capacity reductions are anticipated to occur in the PJM region, which recently ex experienced an all-time high peak, and the CERC region, which is in the southeastern portion of the country. But both ERCOT and SPP have also expressed concerns about the localized effects on the electric grid. There will be very high electricity rate increases, as has been observed by the committee members, and significant 
job losses associated with the implementation of these rules. According to a recent study by NERA, the cross-state rule and <clears throat> the Utility MACT rule will, resu will result in over 1.4 million net job losses in the U.S. There is a better way. We would like to see more holistic analysis of EPA's regulatory programs and an effort to coordinate the implementation of these requirements. They can be phased in reasonably over a slightly more extended period of time and achieve the same environmental outcomes. That time will reduce the impact on our customers and the economy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henry. Mr. Carey? Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich, members of the committee, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to testify today at this very important hearing. The effects of the EPA's pending and planned proposals will have on electricity prices, employers, domestic workers will be devastating. My name is Mike Carey. I am President of the Ohio Coal Association. We are an association that provides a voice for the many thousands of citizens working in Ohio's coal sector. Cheap, affordable coal is what powers the manufacturing base and maintains our families across the Midwest and other regions of America. The companies we represent, both large and small, are proud to directly employ over 3,000 individuals, as well as the 30,000 additional secondary jobs that depend on our sector. These jobs and hundreds of more, thousands more are at risk directly because of the decisions underway by the EPA. In particular, it is my hope that this committee will undertake a serious review of the work being conducted by the EPA as it relates to the following proposals the cross-state air pollution rule, formerly known as the Clean Air Transport Rule, the Air Toxic Standards for Utilities, or Utility MAC, the New Source Performance Standard Changes, the New Ozone Particular Matter Standards, Regulation for Coal Combustion Residuals, and the Power Plant Cooling Water Intake Structure Rule. Members of this body have probably heard this grouping of proposals called the EPA train wreck. The regulatory wave embodied in these new mandates and rules above stands to cause great harm not only to Ohio, but to the rest of the American economy. Today, coal is mined in over 27 states across the nation and is consumed in over 48 as reliable and affordable power. I will focus my time today on the two most harmful EPA proposals. The first, the cross-state air pollution rule. The underlying assumption of this proposal, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is that our customers, the electric utilities like American Electric Power, like First Energy and Duke Energy, will simply move to a lower sulfur content coal. That assumes that the companies will even continue to use coal in the first place. They could fuel switch to natural gas. This ultimately could disrupt the natural gas markets. This administration proposes to sacrifice these 33,000 primary and secondary jobs that we create, and that is as simple as it gets. EPA's complex rule creates a system of allowances and trading that is much less flexible than the current regulatory framework. Winners and losers are thus clearly chosen, and Ohio is a loser. The only option for those producing electricity in our State, as we have already seen in many cases, is to shut down or potentially shut down their plants. The second most harmful proposal, in our view, is the utility MAC rule. When the proposals are both finalized, the national and regional impacts will be devastating. Ohio alone will lose 53,000 jobs, and electricity prices could, could certainly spur and hurt the middle and lower class Americans, which already play, pay almost 16 to 22 percent of their annual after-tax income on energy costs annually. The future of Midwestern jobs and access to affordable energy depends on demanding that the EPA examine the cu cumulative impacts of their regulatory proposals. Oversight for how these flawed proposals are cost, unworkable, and harm to the U.S. economy should continue. In the interim, Congress must seek to enact policies that address the flaws in the EPA's proposals that I have outlined. EPA's war on coal will also be harmful to the homeowners across the country. As the studies have shown in the train wreck, will result in electricity prices that would increase 13 percent in Ohio, 23 percent in Tennessee, and 17 percent in Pennsylvania. Now, I understand that this week the House will take up the spending measures 
that will reduce the EPA's funding by 18 percent. My concern is that the EPA will simply find a way to shuffle around the funds, and such a cut will not stop their plans to move forward with the train wreck. It is the belief of the Ohio Coal Association that Congress must be bolder. Delay these rules immediately is critical, and the House must then act to write legislation that makes these rules more reasonable. Without a clear direction from Congress in this fashion, EPA will continue its torrid pace of piling on new job crushing policies. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I stand ready to ask, answer any question the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Dr. Schwartz, if you would proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, Mr. Kucinich. Um, certainly the regulations that we have heard about, like the transport rule, will impose significant costs on industry, but they will also produce significant health benefits, and I would like to talk a bit about that. Particulate matter is one of the largest avoidable causes of death in the United States. To put that in perspective, particulate matter kills more people each year in the United States than AIDS, breast cancer, and prostate cancer put together. That is a big number. And the difference is, we don't know how to cure AIDS, breast cancer, and prostate cancer, but we do know how to put scrubbers on coal-burning power plants. And so it is important to think about it in that respect. And this is not just my opinion. This is a worldwide scientific consensus. In 2005, the World Health Organization said that particulate matter killed 800,000 people a year in the world's cities alone. The American Medical Association has endorsed these conclusions, as has the American Thoracic Society, the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association. Um, the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee has extensively reviewed EPA's science assessment for particles over the last several years and concluded that the association with mortality was causal, that the risk assessment was sound, except they said that what EPA cited as their high estimate was actually a mid-range estimate because there were lots of studies that showed bigger effects. The National Academy of Sciences in the United States has endorsed this conclusion in two separate reports. In 2005, the European Union proposed a strategy to reduce particles because their scientific review concluded it killed a lot of people. And their strategy was to impose an 82 percent reduction in SO2 emissions, primarily by retrofitting scrubbers on coal-burning power plants. So this, this is really a consensus view um, of the worldwide scientific community. And the reasons they believe that are simple. We have lots of studies in the scientific literature to support this. We have studies that compare death rates in more polluted towns and less polluted towns, and they are higher in more polluted towns. We have studies that have looked at changes in particle concentrations in cities and changes in their death rates. And the more the particle concentrations drop, the more the death rates drop in those locations. We have studies that have then said, well, let's forget about those downward trends and let's look at just year-to-year -year fluctuations around the downward trend in particles and year-to-year -year fluctuations in death rates went with those changes in particles. We have studies that looked at strikes and found that death rates fell when major industries that were important sources of air pollution were shut down and went back up when they were turned on again. And then buttressing all of this, we have studies from animals that show that if you expose animals over a period of months to particles compared to filtered air, that they develop much more atherosclerosis. And the atherosclerotic plaques 
become much less stable and more likely to rupture. And it's been done in multiple studies. We have animal studies showing that if you produce ischemia in animals and expose them to particles, the blood flow to the heart is reduced further compared to one's breathing filtered air. We have studies showing that you can produce arrhythmias in animals by exposing them to particles. So in addition to all the human studies, we have a great deal of toxicology that backs this up. And this is why review committee after review committee and scientific body and medical body after medical body have all come to the conclusion that this is really happening. And the numbers that we are talking about are quite large. So the mid-range number from EPA's expert elicitation or from what CASAC said says that the transport rule will save 34,000 early deaths per year. That is a really big deal. And yes, it costs money, but actually the cost per life saved is about $100,000 a life. And that is actually pretty cheap among public health interventions that are available to us. So I think that these are important issues, but it is important to realize that there are very public, important public health benefits that, that will result from uh, putting these controls on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. I am going to yield the uh, ranking member five minutes for questions. I want, to, I want to thank the gentlelady for her indulgence. I am going to have to leave. Uh, as soon as I am through with the questions, uh, I am offering an amendment on the floor. I am very grateful for your kindness. Uh, at a uh, June 1, 2011 meeting with investors when discussing the risk of closures of plants as a result of EPA rules, the chairman of AEP, Michael Morris, told investors the following. Uh, as you know, those are high-cost plants throughout mo almost all of 2009. Those plants probably didn't run 5 percent of the time because of natural gas prices. When we shut those down, there will be some cost savings as well, and on balance we think that is the appropriate way to go. It is the sum and substance of what was said. Now, what CEO Morris is saying is that AEP has already had to shut down certain coal-burning power plants due to competitive pressure from lower-cost natural gas. These are the same plants that would have to be retrofitted or shut down to comply with EPA regulations. Now, Ms. Henry, if AEP is already shutting down, the same uh, plants because they are high costs and are uncompetitive in the market. Um, how can you come here today and portray EPA's rules as infeasible and blame the EPA for forcing a large number of premature power plant requirements? Thank you, Ranking Member Kucinich. Um, the plants referred to in the Chairman's remarks and the plants referred to in the studies that have been conducted as a result of EPA's rules um, are not necessarily the same plants. Um, I think that we will need to go back and look at You are saying, so you're saying you really don't know which plants he's talking about, is that right? That, I am not certain. The universe okay. We would like you to provide that information to this committee. I will committee. And, and information. If I could respond Well, to no, you don't have the answer, so I am going to ask my next question. Uh, if the price of natural gas relative to coal stays where it was at the time your CEO was explaining his decision to close certain plants, and that price stays the same through 2014, isn't it a fact that AEP will keep those plants closed through 2014? If the price of natural gas stays at the current rates and Right, at the time he was, right. As, as the time the Chairman was making. Will, will those plants stay closed through 20? The plants were running at low capacity factors. They were not closed. And those plants run during times of peak energy demand and are used to respond to needs for additional power on days like we experienced this past week. Having those plants available to respond to those peak demands is critical to the integrity of the electrical grid. So what you are saying is that those plants are specifically part of uh, reach, meeting peak demands and they are uh, otherwise uh, totally efficient and uh, not subject to, uh, uh, to, um, to market fluctuations that would come about as a result of natural gas uh, competition. Certainly, if the price of natural gas were to increase significantly, their capacity factors might go up because their dispatch might be more economic than the gas plants that run also at peak periods of time. Um, but I think that uh, the 
critical point is that the plants provide both that peak capacity reserve and all Well, if natural gas costs more, but what if natural gas costs less? Wouldn't, wouldn't it likely be that those plants would be out of capacity because they are not uh, able to compete with natural gas? That would depend upon the availability of those plants and other plants on the system to respond to that peak. When, did AEP lay off those workers at the plants that had to close due to lower price natural gas, or did you find other assignments for them? Um, some of the workers were part of a voluntary severance program that we conducted last year in response so they weren't, to the So they were voluntarily economic. separated. They weren't laid off. Is That's that what right. you are saying? That is right. Um, but so they lost there will their be jobs. additional 600 jobs lost when those plants are finally closed. Ms. Henry, AEP is the author of a bill entitled Electric, Electric Power Regulatory Coordination Act of uh, 2011. Is that correct? I, I I don't think there is a you, you haven't heard that? Okay. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with the bill by that name? I am not familiar with the bill by that name. Uh, Madam Chair, I am going to uh, ask uh, uh, yeah, I got it. Uh, unanimous consent to put this uh, report by the NAACP and other groups. And about uh, uh, the situation in Ohio with respect to coal and electric utilities. Without objection. Um, I, I want to. Uh, are you familiar with the uh, Ms. Henry with the draft uh, discussion draft circulated uh, that's been uh, dubbed the Electric Power Regulatory Coordination Act of 2011 that would halt implementation of the nation's clean air laws. I am not familiar with you never heard of that specific draft that you're referring to no you, you don't you have no knowledge whatsoever of any of any kind of uh, of discussion draft that relates to a bill by that name I know that AEP assisted in the preparation of some suggested language for legislation that might have had that impact I, well, th that's what I'm talking about uh, this, this bill proposes to wait another six years before we limit toxic mercury from some power plants, as well as delaying limits on a host of other uh, dangerous pollutants. Is that, that not correct? That would be an incorrect characterization. Pardon? That would be an incorrect characterization of the language that AEP proposed. Are you, well, wait, that you, you just told me, are you familiar with this bill or not? You know the bill or don't you? You are just giving me a response that it is an incorrect characterization of a bill that you weren't really sure about. I said I'm not familiar with whatever it is, whatever the document. Okay, I, I withdraw my sure. question, Madam Chair. I'm going to submit uh, questions in writing so that uh, Ms. Henry can become familiar with uh, uh, the questions that we're concerned about, and also she can familiarize herself with her own understanding of this draft discussion that I'm asking about. I appreciate it. Thank you. Without objection. Okay, I will yield myself five minutes for questions. Um, first of all, Ms. Henry, I wanted to give you the opportunity. It seemed to me you had an answer to uh, the ranking member's question that you weren't allowed to give. If you wanted to, early in his line of questioning, he was speaking to you. Um, if, if I could continue my response, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the legislation that AP AEP was discussing with certain members of Congress would have provided for a phased-in program to allow sufficient time in order for all of the controls that are required by the various EPA proposals to be phased in over a slightly longer period of time than is proposed under the cross-state air pollution rule and the utility MACT rule. Instead of having all of the requirements become final and effective in 2014, there would have been an extension through 2020 and a phased-in program with specific um, levels of control required to be achieved throughout that time period. Thank you. And, and this question is for Ms. Henry as well as Mr. Carey. The EPA timelines to comply with these regulations, is it realistic or unrealistic? Based on our experience, it is an unrealistic time frame for the installation of the very sophisticated controls that are necessary to control the types of coals that are produced in many of our states, including Ohio. Um, 
FGD systems, flue gas desulfurization systems, and SCR systems are required to achieve the levels that are set forth in the EPA regulations for SO2 and NOx, and also to achieve the co-benefits of mercury reductions from those um, same power plants. Thank you. And those Mr. require about four and a half to five years to complete. Mr. Carey. Um, Chairman, I, I would agree with I would agree with her analysis of, of of how that would affect the power producing facilities and what that actually would do for the coal producers of the state would be a removal of us from the marketplace because they sim simply could not meet the time frames as I mentioned go to a go to a lower sulfur coal or an, and or possibly switching to natural gas. Can uh, e can each of you comment just? Uh, briefly, because I want to get through this line of questioning with regards to this, these um, compliance timelines, how many jobs can you estimate would be lost? Based on the comprehensive analysis that was done by NERA, um, we estimate that about 1.4 million net job losses would occur in the United States through the time period 2020 as a result of these regulations. And the if two regulations that we are talking about are the cross-state air pollution rule and the utility MACT rule, the impacts are probably more severe than that based on the final rule because NERA did its analysis on the proposed rule and not the final rule. And if you had um, more time to comply, would that affect the number of jobs lost? Yes, it would, because we would be able to modif moderate the electricity rate increases associated with the installation of the controls and spread that over a longer period of time. Thank you. And the same two questions to you, Mr. Carey. According, Madam Chair, according to the NERA study, in alone that loss of jobs just because of those two proposals would be 53,000 direct jobs in the State. Um, of which uh, many of those jobs would come from the, the Appalachian coal fields because of the direct jobs in the mining industry and the up to 11 spinoff jobs that occur from one coal mining job. So the numbers would be significant in that region. And again, if there is longer time for compliance, will that affect the number of jobs lost? Um, Madam Chair, I think certainly that could affect the ultimate, uh, the ultimately the amount of of coal that we could continue to put into those power produ producing facilities. So yes. Thank you. Now, um, can either or both of you actually comment on what this will do to electricity rates? You heard uh, in the previous panel of the testimony that it will raise slightly, but I'd like to hear your thoughts about what it will do to the elect uh, electricity rates. Well, the EPA analysis has been done on an average basis nationwide and not on an individual company basis. Obviously, those companies that are most dramatically impacted by the rules bear the highest costs of compliance and their rates increase the most. For the AEP companies, the rate increases we have estimated range from 10 percent at the lowest end of the range to almost 35 percent in those areas most highly impacted. Thank you. Mr. Kerry. Madam Chair, I, I think if you, if you look at, um, in, in my testimony I outlined what Nira also said was that if you break it down by State, the average cost uh, for electric rates for certain States across the country, uh, in particular Ohio, is at 13 percent, 23 percent in Tennessee, and 17 percent in Pennsylvania. So you can just go down the list and all of the States would see there would be regional variances in, in, the, in the cost of the electricity increase, but definitely all increasing. Thank you. Um, I want to ask one more question of the two of you and then Dr. Schwartz. I'll, I don't want you to feel left out here this afternoon. Um, the EPA is a singular regulatory body, and yet we see so many regulations coming out of it from so many various agencies and departments. I would like for you to um, comment. Uh, and Mr. Kerry, I can start with you and then Ms. Henry. Have you seen any signs that there is a coordination of or a look at how all of these regulations affect businesses. I mean, one regulation by itself may not be bad, but cumulatively they may devastate businesses, and, and that's, that's why we are here today, our concern for what this cumulative effect is doing for jobs and job creation. So if you could comment on that, certainly, I would appreciate it. Certainly. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I don't think there is any doubt that we are seeing in the, in the coal fields of not just Ohio, but I think West Virginia, Pennsylvania, uh, Illinois, Kentucky, you are seeing a coordinated attack because 
the, the, the new restrictions on certain coal permits, the, uh, the fact that the U.S. EPA is getting involved in a lot of the, the processes that normally would have taken place under the State EPA or the State permitting program, you are seeing that federal, uh, the, the federal go into the States, start revoking permits, as happened in the State of West Virginia. So what you have is systematically you have the U.S. EPA not allowing for coal to be permitted to get out of the ground and then ultimately trying to take away the market that the coal could go to. So I guess you could say that the EPA believes that they can control both the laws of supply and demand, ultimately to the detriment of the entire country. Thank you. Ms. Henry? The EPA regulations are analyzed in a silo. Each individual requirement is analyzed only for its individual costs and benefits, and there is no comprehensive analysis undertaken. That results in a failure to consider the cumulative impacts at any individual facility, let alone across an industrial sector. And for an example, um, the suite of regulations that are currently before us include not only the air pollution regulations, but also the cooling tower requirements and the coal combustion residuals rulemaking. Um, each of those rules has its own costs, and all of them would be considered by a utility before any investment would be made to determine whether the long-term viability of the facility is justified. So it is essential that EPA not only do cumulative analyses within an individual office or division like the Air Division, but that it take a holistic view of all of the regulatory programs that are coming out of the various offices within EPA. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Schwartz, um, in your testimony you talk a lot about the negative health effects of particulate matter. Yes. And I want to um, clarify if Primarily, particulate matter is regulated by NACs. Is that correct? Well, there is a NACs for particulate matter, but then there are also new source performance standards and, you know, best available control technology and a bunch of other regulations as well. Um, the transport rule is primarily being put out to help states come into attainment with the NACs because we know that particles don't actually stop at state borders. Um, and so that was the clean air interstate rule that was originally proposed was for the purpose of doing that. Um, the MACT, I think, is an entirely different thing that has nothing to do with the ambient air quality standard. Well, the concern is that, that that there was a duplication in the count of particulate matter, and for the you know to to make the case, you know. Oh, uh, so I I mean I haven't read every document that EPA has produced, but certainly when EPA did the regulatory impact analysis for the ongoing round of revision of the ambient air quality standards for particles. They said, what if we got particles levels down to some point, and what might be the costs and the benefits of that um, in their risk assessment? They didn't specifically propose rules that would accomplish that, but they implicitly assumed that one of the rules that was going to be providing a lot of the help was the transport rule. So if you looked at the benefits of those two things and added them up, that would be incorrect. It would also be incorrect if you looked at the cost of those two things and added it up. The transport rule is one of the strategies that EPA is proposing to help come into attainment with the current NACs and with any future NACs. Um, and so it should be a subcategory under there for both costs and benefits. Thank you. Um, Ms. Henry, do you, I want you to comment, if you could, um, on whether it is fair that the EPA essentially double counted the benefits. Madam Vice Chair, I, I think that 
primary objection that we have to EPA's benefits analysis is that for the cross-state air pollution rule, um, EPA assumed that current requirements that apply to our facilities under the Clean Air Interstate rule don't exist. So they started from an artificial baseline and overstated the benefits that would be achieved through the cross-state rule. Um, with respect to the Utility MACT rule, the benefits that are affiliated with reducing the hazardous and toxic air emissions under that rule amount to um, negligible benefits compared to the costs. Um, the costs are, as I think the Chairman stated previously, about $10.7 billion per year, and the benefits are around $50 million associated with reductions in mercury. EPA claimed it could not quantify any benefits associated with any other individual hazardous air pollutant, but they did quantify benefits associated with reductions in particulate matter, and those are the benefits that they claim are achieved through the reductions of the Utility MACT rule. Thank you. Mr. Carey, would you like to comment on that? Well, with that, since there's no other members here for questioning, um, I would like to thank all three of you for being here this afternoon, for being willing to ans answer our questions and to testify. Um, I think the um, chairman called this committee. Our concern is always that regulations are putting such burdens on businesses in our country. Uh, and given the unemployment rate, we have a, a responsibility to, to act responsibly. And, and as I mentioned uh, to the previous panel, that no one is saying we don't need regulations, but we need reasonable regulations that don't put companies out of business, that create barriers to their success, that, uh, you know, we see compliance and then we see new regulations that require retrofitting. So I thank you all for being here today, and uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.